Nisha, have you noticed my backdrop? You don't have a backdrop. It's just your... I meant the background. <laughs> the, the, the Titanic. Oh, yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Because we're talking about the, the deep sea today. Ooh, scary. So it's, so it's Titanic. Also, you can't see the side, but there's also like a little battleship and a little globe as well. But I, I, think, they're, I think they're visible. Ooh, ocean-themed. Yes. Ocean time. It's often said that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deepest oceans. Of course we do, the moon's made of cheese. Whether or not that statement is true has been a subject of debate, but what is definitely true is that it's taken us a very long time to discover anything about the ocean, I mean, in particular, the deepest parts of the ocean. And you may wonder why. It's because, to put it simply, exploring the ocean is really, really dangerous. So do you like the ocean? Do I like the ocean? Well, if people don't know, Brad comes from an island. Because um, <laughs> Brad comes from the sea. <laughs> Brad comes Arr. from the sea. I rose up from the waves onto land and joined the fact. No, um, I, uh, uh, where I come from is an island. I say it's an island. It's technically a bit of land connected by a bridge with a channel that runs through it. But I get to say island because it's cooler. Obviously, that means I had access to the sea a lot when I was a kid. And now I'm older and I live in Sheffield in the middle of the country, surrounded by fucking hills, I don't get to enjoy the ocean as much. So yeah, I, I would say I like the ocean, and I miss the ocean. A lot of people tend to be afraid of the ocean, understandably. Because like you said, it's we don't really know much about it. Yeah, like we've, I'm assuming we've done a lot of deep like deep sea diving and stuff, but there's so much ocean that there's... Is it like something ridiculous, like 80% is still uncovered or something like that? Yeah, so I think we've only explored around 10 to 20% of the ocean. Mm. So 80% we don't know. It's probably just fish and rocks. Like, I'm not going to go in as like, oh, there's all of these sea monsters. No, it's it's fish and rocks. But we, we don't know what kind of fish and what kind of rocks. So, obviously... <laughs> Scary <laughs> fish can... and scary rocks. <laughs> I mean, I have seen some pictures of some fish that you find in the deep. Oh, fuck me, like the one, what they call the angler fish with the yeah. fucking sharp mm. teeth and the light. Mm. You've said oh, a lot of people must have explored the deep ocean. Uh, not true, actually. Uh, very few actual physical people have been to the deep ocean, or at least the deepest parts of the ocean, because it is so dangerous to explore. And I, I mean, have a hazard a guess why exploring the deep ocean would be so dangerous. Because there's a lot of scary monsters. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Weirdly, I don't have any notes on the creepy monsters because I've gone for more like the, you know, things like light and temperature and pressure. My other answer would have been the pressure and, you know, not being able to see and breathe and stuff. Yeah, so um, the pressure is the big one. We'll get to that in a second. But when it comes to things like light, for example, obviously the light can penetrate the water but it can't penetrate the water all the way down to the bottom of the deepest oceans. When you get to around, say, 600 feet deep, you can see fuck all. Like, you can barely see anything with the human eye. But as you get deeper and deeper, the light becomes more, like less and less present until you reach a point that's like, say, 1,500 feet down. And the number is that there is about a millionth of the light coming down left. Like, that's how dark it gets down here. You can see nothing. So light's a problem. Also, temperature is a problem. The deeper you go, the colder it gets. And right at the deep bottom of the deepest oceans, you're looking at around one to two degrees, so close to freezing. But as you mentioned, pressure. Pressure is one of the biggest killers when it comes to people trying to get deeper in the ocean. Because if you think about how much weight is being pushed downwards from all of the water above, it's incredibly difficult for anything to survive. Like up until a certain point, people, like scientists generally thought nothing could live in the deepest ocean. They thought the pressure is too high, nothing can survive. Obviously, we know now that's not true. We've had uh, samples and things brought up from right at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, and you can see that there are some things that can live that deep. But speaking of the Mariana Trench, this is a good idea to get a perspective of how bad the pressure actually is in the deepest ocean. So, Nisha, have you heard of the Mariana Trench? I think so. Is that the one that like, Bo got stuck recently? Was that smells? Was, wasn't that the Suez Canal? I don't know. <laughs> the Suez Canal is the one where the, the shipping container got turned sideways and got wedged. Oh, I'm thinking of that one. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the Mariana Trench. <laughs> Which one's that one, then? Uh, the Mariana Trench is uh, the deepest point on Earth. It's like between... Oh, that's uh, definitely India not that, then, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> and that boat just got right wedged in there. No, uh, in the... <laughs> 
<laughs> in the Pacific Ocean, there is a, a essentially a crack in the ground in the um the, the ocean floor called the Mariana Trench, and you go into that and you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deepest point in the whole planet is at the bottom of this Mariana Trench. It's it's known as Challenger Deep, and it's named after the Challenger, which was the ship which first did the uh, the vast exploration of the um, oceans of our world like back stuck. in the day. I no, got it, stuck. <laughs> the, tra- the Challenger wasn't a submarine; it was just a boat. It sailed around. It got samples. Yeah, it could still get it did... stuck. <laughs> Maybe it did get stuck. In the comments, did Sorry, the I'm... Challenger get just... stuck on its adventure? I'm just ruining your presentation. Go on. <laughs> yes, you are. God, all this research I do to try and live up to the lofty heights of Carl, and he has Nisha like, but did it get stuck though? <laughs> <laughs> We're at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, Challenger Deep, the deepest point known. Known point, because it could be somewhere deeper. I mean, obviously, the core's deeper, but the deepest <laughs> known point on the surface of the Earth. And uh, the depth is between, these are the figures I've got, between 10,902 and 10,929 metres, or 35,768 feet, or 35,856 So, 11,000 metres, or 36,000 feet. Like in, in respect to the size of the planet, it's not that deep because the actual surface of the planet is like, I think there's a an old little factoid that was like, if you took our globe, removed all the water from it and shrunk it down to the size of a golf ball, it would be the smoothest sphere that humanity will ever have seen because the surface of our planet, like the, the rays between the highest and lowest points is minuscule in respect to the size of the actual planet. But for us, it's deep. And I've got a few things here because I was trying to find a, like, it's always nice to have a representation of how deep something is. So I tried to find some examples of this. And apparently it's six Grand Canyons deep. Wow. So six Grand Canyons. Mm -hmm. Uh, 13 Burj Khalifas. (laughs) Tallest building, 13 of them. And uh, if you put Mount Everest upside down on the surface of the planet, it would still not touch the bottom by two kilometers. Deep? Deep. Pretty deep. deep. Uh, however, just to add a little bit of misery to this, man-made plastics have been found at the bottom of this. Oh, really? That's how bad like the pollution on this planet's Ooh. got. The, the deepest place in the ocean has man-made plastic in it. But the reason we're talking about Challenger Deep is pressure. We were talking about pressure. So this number won't mean too much to people, but the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench is around 17,000 PSI. This is 1,071 times the pressure that you would get at sea level. If you had a litre of air... So say half a bottle of, everyone knows what a litre is, like a litre, half a bottle of a big two litre bottle. Um, if you had one of those and you took that right to the bottom, it would be crushed down to the size, the air, not the bottle. It would be crushed down to the size, of, I'm terrible at this, of the size of a pea. Ooh. <laughs> so the, the pressure is so high that one litre of air would be crushed down to the size of a pea. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how much force is being pushed into here. Uh, you may ask well, what would happen if a human went down there. I thought this was going to be amazing. I thought we were going to get this horrific story of like murder and death and explosion. Murder, <laughs> murder well, by not, the sea. Mur- <laughs> Poseidon. No, I thought we would get this really cool story about the uh, like the way that the human body would be fucked up. You know, they always say if you go into space, your head pops, even though it doesn't. So um, I was looking into this, and apparently, no, it wouldn't. All that would happen is your lungs would get compressed, your ribs would break, and you'd just die because. Apparently pressure, like that high pressure, doesn't do a huge amount to our bodies because it's very hard to compress the solids and liquids. Mm. So we we die. Yeah, it's a lot of bone and muscle to compact yeah. uh, or compress and, to compact. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. This, is, this has been observed before because there's this thing. I'm going to do a video on this because this is really interesting. There's a thing called whale fall. Have you heard of whale fall? Nope. Whale fall is when a whale dies and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And when it does this, it creates this ridiculously interesting ecosystem for all of the life that lives down there because that life barely gets any food. Oh, so they feed off it. Yeah, and it becomes this hub and all these different things come in. I'm I'm going to do a full video on it at some point because I just thought it was fascinating. And it sounds so, like, epic. Like, imagine if you were... Like, imagine doing a film where humanity lived on this barren wasteland and these, like, flying creatures lived above and we only ever got to eat when one of them died and fell to the planet. Like... How interesting would that be? I just imagine like the fight to get the food. It's like they'd be like, I just imagine like there being a siren when something's falling from the sky, like from Silent Hill or something. <laughs> and then everyone's just running. 
risk location. Shadows, just get, the world just goes dark as this huge monster comes down. Yeah, you've got to be careful to, not to... to be crushed by it to start with. And then, yeah. And then you would be eaten. You'd become part of the meal. Oh, extra food, yay. Mm, delicious. Mm. Uh, but to finish the talk about the... Because I haven't even got onto the main subject of this video yet. All I'm talking about is how dangerous it is. What I want to actually talk about is a couple of the missions that have been done to reach the deep ocean. But just to, a bit of perspective on humans. The deepest that a human being has ever just free-dived without equipment was a man named Herbert Niche. Or Niche. Oh, we share the same name. I, I'm, or I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, and they managed to dive to 253 metres deep, which is fuck all when compared to what we've been talking about. And when they came up, they suffered multiple strokes. And it took them so long to recover from it because of the decompression that happens through changes in pressure. Jesus. Dangerous ocean. Yeah. Dangerous. So if the ocean is this dangerous, then you have to ask yourself, well, how did we explore it? So I mentioned the Challenger mission earlier. Uh, Challenger was a ship that sailed around and did things like dredging. They investigated from the surface and brought back samples. They measured things. The funny thing as well, right? So have a guess how they measure how deep the ocean is back in the day. Why does my brain just like think the longest tape measure all the way down? You are correct. Wait, what? <laughs> so what they used to do was get a steel cable and just lower it. And when it stopped, they would look and go, well, that's how deep it is. Okay, then it's not as dark as I thought. No, then. You're completely right. That's what they used to do. The uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this today is because of the first manned mission to the deep sea, and this was a mission that was conducted by uh, William or uh, Charles William Beebe and Otis Barton in 1930, and their ship that they went to the bottom of the well, they didn't go to the bottom. I, I will get onto the bottom in a bit, but they just went deeper than anybody had ever been, and their ship that they did this in was hilariously dangerous so imagine if you will a ball so they built a metal sphere because the sphere is one of the best shapes at handling pressure because any um, pressure applied to any side is spread out very evenly which is uh, originally i think beeb wanted to make a cylinder i noticed barton got in contact and was like no no <laughs> ball so they had a ball that was 1.5 inches thick made of cast iron so strong as fuck and this thing had three portholes built into it which had three inch thick quartz because at the time this fused quartz was the strongest material they had that you could see through so they had these three inch thick windows and there were three portholes two of them had glass in and one of them was just clogged up they didn't use it the idea being that you could look out of these obviously we'll talk in a second about how useless that is because you can't fucking see anything down there but uh, in order to do this, have a guess, because uh, you got the other one right, like the one about the tape measure. Have a guess how this thing uh, went deep, uh, like deep into the ocean and how it rose. So my first thought would be just an engine of some sort. Nope, didn't have an engine. So the only other option would be it was lowered in? It was, dangling on, a, it was <laughs> dangling on a metal string. So, <laughs> so uh, because this thing was so heavy... They had it attached to a winch on a boat and just lowered it. And it would lower down, lower down, lower down. And then when they get to the depth they want, they can do what they want to do with it. And then they can write, they raise it back up. Not the safest thing in the world. Uh, obviously, they did a lot of experiments and tests and things. I like just try and make sure it worked. It was lowered in without people before. But so many things could go wrong and did go wrong during the time period they were using this. So the first problem is, how do you breathe? It's a tiny little... Um, ball. And when I say tiny, I, w I don't want you to think that it's like, you know, because the um, it was called a bathysphere, this um, submarine ship. And um, if anyone's interested, uh, bathy to mean deep, and sphere is a sphere. So deep, deep ball. Um, and if anyone's ever played Bioshock, they have bathyspheres in that, which are used to get into Rapture. But I don't mean like comfort, big spheres. This thing is fucking tiny. Like, to fit two people in, they would be pressed together. Uh, so you'd be thinking, like, how do you breathe? So they had oxygen uh, cylinders in the ship to help them breathe. But then the issue there is, well, how do you get rid of carbon dioxide? And what do you do about a buildup of moisture? What they had to do was they had these cans of soda lime, which is a chemical that can react with CO2 and get rid of it. They had those mm -hmm. just open in the boat, in the ship, in the ball sphere. They also had calcium chloride, which was there to absorb the moisture. 
but the air in the ball didn't circulate very well. So in order to circulate this air, they had to use palm fronds. What's that? As in palm leaves. <laughs> Wait, what? They were sat inside this metal ball, being lowered into the ocean, waving leaves in order to not die. Oh, I thought it was like a specific thing when you said that. No. I didn't realize it's actually palm leaves. You know when we played uh, oh, no. you know when we played Stranded Deep? <laughs> yep. Those things. <laughs> those, I those know what th palm leaves are. <laughs> But it's just like, what you said something like palm from Fro fr Frond. It's the palm frond. frond. It's what the branches are called. See, well, I didn't know that. I have a palm plant here as well. It all fits in together. <laughs> See, I didn't know that word. So I just like, what, some sort of palm object. <laughs> <laughs> but no, actual leaves. Yeah. <laughs> but they eventually did replace this with an electric fan. And I don't understand why they didn't have a fan in the first place. Maybe I it was think, a, a budgetary thing. I just think, oh, maybe a fan would be you know, useful. Well, the thing was, they had electricity because the cable that they were lowered down on also had some wires attached to it to allow them to A, communicate, and B, supply electricity for them to use for the, the floodlight that they had in there with them. So why did they have a fan then? I don't know. It was 1930. <laughs> like, maybe the fan uh, yeah. maybe the fan was invented in 1932. I, I don't know. <laughs> they just didn't have a fan. And <laughs> this is the thing that initially wanted me to talk about this because... The, obviously with Fact Fiend, the idea is to get like an initial hook. There's meant to be something fascinating from history. And the fact that this thing that was going to one of the most dangerous places on the planet, and these people were kept alive by leaves. I'm, my brain's just thinking about, you You said this thing was really small. Yeah. That if you put two people in it, they'd be like squashed together. Very much so. I think, I, when I, I say... say how on earth are you going to waft? <laughs> 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 I, I'm guessing the palm fronds aren't as big as you're probably imagining. No, no, I'm just thinking like, because what you've seen in fiction with the massive palm leaves and stuff, <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining how on earth? <laughs> I don't know why a piece of paper surely would have been better. Why a palm frond? I don't know. I, I honestly, because they were, they were doing this off the coast of Bermuda, so maybe it was just a problem they didn't think about. And after doing a few tests, they were like, we need something to waft, just give us a leaf. But as we've said, this thing was just hanging from a wire. It was being lowered down and up on a piece of me on a metal cable. And um, one of the biggest issues, one of the things they were really concerned about, is that if they did any shallower dives, they would crash into cliffs and rocks and things underwater because this thing, they had no control over it. And as they lowered it down, it could go fucking anywhere. So they had to attach a rudder on the inside that they could control on the outside to steer the ball so they didn't just get pelted and smashed against every surface they came to. God, it's just weird to think back, like, all them years ago, how different things are, <laughs> how dangerous things were. This is the big thing about the moon landings or any space, early space travel as well. Like, when you hear how many risks were taken and when they're, like, describing some of the components and they're like, oh, it could have failed at any moment. It's like the old F1 drivers. Like, their cars had no safety. Hmm. Like, if you got flipped over in that, you'd be dead. And then it's just like, why would... My first thought is like, why would you want to risk your life doing that? I guess it's but for the... they did. Yeah, it, it, I mean, in this case, it's for the discovery. Uh, these, mm -hmm. these people were determined to, you know, be pioneers in this area. And it was more important to them to make these discoveries than to... Than, than dying, basically. So there's all sorts of other problems with the fact that it's on a cable as well. The, uh, the cable itself would nearly cracked once. The winch broke. Um, they had to wait months to get a replacement. But also, like as they got um, lowered, like th there was one particular dive they did where they went lower and lower and lower, trying to hit a new record. And the ball was swaying side to side so much that they were smashed around, and became bruised, and were bleeding from it. I came in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> and uh, one of them threw up at one point. Oh, I'm not surprised. They threw up on the way down, and the decision was made to oh. carry on. <laughs> Dedica Aww. dedication to science also the re reportedly as well the noise was deafening because it was being like rattled everything inside was being rattled around constantly but there was one particular incident that happened which I thought was very interesting and uh, it was around 1932 and the uh, they were sending it back out under the agreement oh it was it was when the fan was invented, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, the year of the fan, yes. 
Uh, <laughs> what had happened was that they wanted to start recording out of one of the windows. So I haven't even described how they use this thing. They had two windows. They would shine a light out of one and look out the other. Because they, were, <laughs> they didn't have any decent equipment. They had nothing to take samples or monitor anything. They just had their eyes. And a lot of scientists dispute a lot of the discoveries they made because they've only seen it. And the way that the um, the way that species and uh, animals and things are registered with uh, like in science is that you're meant to have a sample before you name it in like the taxonomy and stuff like uh, fancy words. You're meant to have a sample before you can uh, attribute it to anything and assign it classes and things. They didn't have samples because they couldn't get any. So a lot of scientists say the I mean some people say they made all the shit up as well. Some people are like, oh, you're just pretending you see stuff. Or there's some condensation on the window and you're pretending it's a fish. But uh, I think Beeb had a good reputation. So presumably the stuff that he did see. Because he catalogued a lot of new types of fish and creatures. And since mm -hmm. then, a lot of those ones have been seen or confirmed. So uh, we can pretty much assume everything they've said is true. But yeah, they wanted to install a, a third window. And the idea was that they would have a light in one, they would look at one, and they would film through one. Uh, so they removed the, there was like a, a cork made of steel that filled in the third window. They removed that and they added in a uh, another window. And then they did some tests where they lowered it in to check if it was uh, if it was fine. And when they brought it back up, it was full of water. Ooh. And this might just, this might be like, oh, well, it's, that's fine. Nobody, nobody was in it. So what's the problem? But the problem was that the water that was in there was pressurized because of where the uh, bathysphere had been. And this meant that if you opened it in the wrong way, it would fucking kill you. <laughs> because it was essentially, what? it was a bomb. Oh my god. Like the amount of pressure that was being, like because the water that was in there was pressurised water. And what happens to pressurised water when the pressurised container it's in breaks, it expands. So, <laughs> exploding. So um, they had to really carefully unscrew this thing. And they said, when they took the first bolt out, it fired out of its hole with such force that it chipped a half inch deep gouge out of the metal winch. So you're going to say something like it, like, hit someone in the face, <laughs> went straight through? Thankfully not, but it could very easily have just gone straight through somebody. Like, Beeb and Barton said themselves, if any water had got in, like, the same, if, the, if they'd been in that, when it had been filling with water, a single droplet of water being fired in at that pressure would have been like a gunshot. They would have been shredded to pieces because that's how dangerous that um, water is at that pressure. Under pressure equivalent to that at depth of 2,000 meters, the thick steel walls collapse. See, I never really think about that, like it being that ridiculous. So I just think you just think, oh, it's just water. I don't know how <laughs> to explain it. It's just, it's just water to be fine. I don't think of it being pressurized to the point where it could be deadly in that way. The easiest example of pressurization that we have is things like carbonated drinks. If you shake the bottle mm. and take the top off it, it just goes everywhere. Yeah. Or even like um, a cork on a uh, champagne bottle. Well, that's yeah. the same principle, is that the gas, uh, the CO2 is being converted into gas in the bottle. And because the gas is less dense, <laughs> because the gas spreads out more, it creates a pressurized container and that fires the thing out. So just imagine that, but on like a hundred times scale. <laughs> Because like I said, the, the deepest part of the ocean, this wasn't where they were going. Uh, the deepest they ever made um, during this four year period was 923 meters. So we are nowhere near the 11,000 that we're talking about. <laughs> but even Jesus. at that pressure, it was that strong. So obviously you can imagine how dangerous it would be for people to go to the deepest part of the ocean, which they did. <gasps> Segway. Uh... <laughs> So as far as I'm aware, there have been three humans total who have been to the bottom of the Mariana Trench all the way to Challenger Deep. And those humans are Jacques Picard, Don Walsh, and a third who I'm going to get to right at the end because people may be aware of this one and it's really funny. But this uh, happened in 1960 and they made a ship that was called a Bathys... Bathyscaphe? Or... It's spelled Bathy, the same way the other one is, S-C-A-P-H-E. So, scafe, scafe, scaf, bath scaf. But that translates <laughs> to, are you ready for it? Deep boat. Simple. I, I love how it Effective. sounds, it sounds so cool that it just means deep boat. Boat that Effective. went deep. So, they made a lot of improvements on the original design that was in the bathysphere. Instead of having a cable, they had gasoline on the ship. And the thing about gasoline is that it's very difficult to pressurize, almost impossible 
to pressurize, meaning no matter where it is, the pressure of it would stay consistent. But it's also lighter than water, which meant that if nothing else is acting upon this boat, it would start to float to the surface. So the way that they okay. did it was that they had a lot of weights inside this ship. And when they wanted it to sink, they would fill it with seawater, so it would gradually start to sink. And then when they wanted it to float, they would release the weights, and then it would start to float up to the surface again. And the thing about these weights as well is this is much safer. These weights were magnetized into the ship so that if the ship lost power, it would just float naturally to the top because the magnets would release and the weights would fall. Yeah, that's good. So already much safer. <laughs> yeah. So it took around four hours and 47 minutes for them to descend from the surface all the way down to the bottom of Challenger Deep. And the reason why it took so long is because the descent had to be two miles per hour, so really slow. And they also had to keep stopping on the way to readjust things as the, pr the pressure and the temperature and things changed. But the thing that makes this one particularly scary, at 30,000 feet, so 5,000 feet away from the bottom, they heard a loud crack. A crack that was so loud, it shook the boat. Mm. And these guys were like, Shit. Let's carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no. So they descended all the way to the bottom and they wanted to stay there for a while, but they were told that they could only stay there for like 20 minutes to half an hour. So that's how long they were there and then they were raised to the surface. It turns out one of the windows cracked. So they had this plexiglass window that cracked on the outside, but fortunately it didn't cause any damage to the inside. Because as we said, if that had cracked open and let any water in, they would have been sliced in half by that water. These expeditions were so dangerous, like they were incredibly dangerous, but the, the depressing thing about them is that they didn't really like, find out that much because mm. you couldn't see anything. Like even with the torches that they had, you could barely see anything. I think with the uh, the one that Picard went down in, the Bathurst, the, the, whatever it was called, with that <laughs> one, they had these halogen lights on the outside, but if they turned them on for too long, because the lights were so warm, the water would start boiling which meant you couldn't see anything because it would just be surrounded <laughs> by bubbles. So they got very little actual decent data from it, but it was more like they didn't care. The point was we did it. We wanted to get down there. I think that's one of the amazing things about like exploratory science is just mm. humans testing the limits. Like, can we do it? But there's one last little bit I want to leave you with, Nisha, and audience at home. The, uh, there is a third person who has been to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. This happened in 2012, so recently that the book that I got this inspiration from doesn't list them. It says that the only two people who have ever been down there are Picard and Walsh. This person is none other than director James Cameron. His name is James, James Cameron, the bravest pioneer. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. As soon as you said director, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, obviously, anybody who follows James Cameron's career will know that he is obsessed with the ocean. He made Titanic. He's made Avatar mm -hmm. The Way of Water. Like, he loves the ocean. And there was a South Park episode where he supposedly went to the bottom of the ocean to raise the bar. And I always thought it was just a joke about how much he loved the ocean. But no, it turns out in 2012, he did an expedition where he went... So the first ever, the only ever solo mission to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. He went on his own? Yeah, all on what? his own. That's Which, so scary. Yeah, but it's fascinating. Like, it's so I, I, lo I love it hearing when somebody that you know for one thing is just famous for something else. It's like when you find out an actor can sing and you're like, oh my God, I didn't know that actor could sing. But like a director was is like going down in history as one of the first people to ever go to this place. I just I think that's fascinating. Good on you, James Cameron. So, Nisha, that was a long video. It was. People have my been head asking... hurts. <laughs> From all the I'm, pressure. My voice hurts. Uh... People have been asking in the comments why we're doing the longer videos. And it's because the editing style has been simplified. So it just means that we can do... And also, I think longer form videos are a bit more popular at the moment. You either have super short or super long. Anywhere in the middle, and it's like, why bother? But, you know, hopefully people have learned something cool today about the ocean and how, how, why you should fear it. I feel like I'm getting better at talking to the camera, do you? Do I feel like you're getting better, or do I feel like I'm getting better? Well, I, I mean both, I guess, but I meant me. You, yeah, you definitely. Me, maybe-ish. Maybe not in the way you're doing it. Mm. I couldn't, I'd be, like, I'd be here like two hours. 
I mean, to repeat myself. I definitely make less jokes than Carl. I think he's just, because of his stand-up background, he's much better at being funny. Whereas I just get really interested in what I'm talking about. I keep doing too much research. I think a big part of that is doing the side channel videos, having an opportunity to try different things. Because we uh, we have a second channel, and the point of it is to try new things and not worry. Cause it, because it's Patreon-funded, we don't worry about appeasing the algorithm. We just try new stuff. And I've yeah. been making a, a series called Break Brad, which is Brad's flagship series, and where I just complain about shit that isn't important. And I've been finding that making that series has been making me a lot better. I've noticed a lot of problems, though. I I'd still... I I restart sentences a lot, like that. I do that a lot. Like, I stutter when I start sentences. Uh, I also... Uh, I also have a lot of um, filler noises, and, um, <laughs> uh, um, and I say like um. a lot as well, and I say so a lot. So I... It's about trying to reduce those things, not just for the audience, but to make it easier to edit. But a lot of it's part of natural speech, and like I, I think I kept, I think I care more about it than other people do because I'm listening to myself back. It's like things like breathing. I don't notice when I listen to other people's videos and they breathe, but when I listen to my own videos and I can hear myself breathing, I'm like, oh, ugh, that breath. I'm getting better at researching. Like I found out a lot of stuff about this. Very interesting. Uh, if anyone's interested, by the way, the book that I got this from initially is called The Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, I think. It's, the, it's a very good book. I would recommend it. It's basically a, a history of everything. And I found this hilarious when I first read about it because these people built this ridiculous submarine ship, went super low, like deep in the ocean and don't have any fucking lights on the outside. I have to shine <laughs> a torch through the window. Is there anyone alive out there? <laughs> so, Can anyone uh, hear me? <laughs> I thought it was funny. When you're researching things, you find so many other interesting things. Like, for example, the whale fall, which I want to do a video on, just sounds fascinating. I, I love science. I love science stuff. I love the, like the real world and nature. Uh, particularly interested in like, space and cosmology. So those kind of things are what I'm interested in researching. So I expect mm-hmm. to see more stuff like that from Brad, but... Yeah. Cool beans. 